Come on, somebody. Merry Christmas. Good morning, Word of God. Can we stand together as we reverence the reading of His Word? Are you blessed to be in the assembly today? All, uh, all three services, uh, I, was, I was like, man, what's going on? You know, you've, y'all done came out in Shreveport snow to be, at, uh, to be in service on, on Christmas Eve. And, you know, typically church folks stay home when it's raining. But y'all, y'all were looking at this as, as Shreveport snow and said, I'm going to brave the weather and get on out there and assemble. Amen. Welcome. Good morning to you. Are you blessed to be here this morning? Amen. If you have your Bibles, yeah, clap for the Lord. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the table of contents or the book of Micah, Micah chapter number five. And I had to go, man, clean myself up. I got tore up in worship. Just love magnifying his name and seeing his name. Amen. So today we're in part three. I started this study last Sunday. And we continued it into Wednesday, if you were here, on Bethlehem. And today we're going to end it with the house of bread. That is the meaning of Bethlehem. When you say Bethlehem, you're saying house of bread, house of bread. And I I assure you, there's going to be a lot we're going to cover because you came to the 1130 service, so you don't want the clock to be a factor. And so I'm going to get you home in time before the chicken gets dry. It's going to all be good. Don't be nervous, all right? But I'm excited about what we're going to get into today. We're going to begin in Micah 5. And when you get over there, just say amen. Amen. We'll look at verse number 2. It says, but thou Bethlehem, Bethlehem. You'll notice there's a little bit of a break in that word. That first part, Beth, is taken from the Hebrew word bait which is the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it actually means house. You may be familiar with that covering, that study we covered in our Aleph Beit conference. So that Beth there, Beit, is uh, referring to a house. Lehem, referring to bread. So it means house of bread. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he, Jesus, come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old. How far back? Everlasting. You'd have, to look into ev- you'd have to look into eternity past and still couldn't wrap your head around the origin of Jesus. Amen? With that in mind, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we trust and thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. For Lord Jesus, you said that when your Holy Spirit would come, that he would lead us into truth and that he would take from the Father and show it unto us that you might be glorified. So I ask, Father, that your Spirit would do something today that goes beyond my ability, and that is that the Son, Jesus, be glorified through everything that is said and heard and done here today. That it be for your glory, Jesus, that you be known. And I ask by your spirit that you would give me the ability to convey your heart. And by your spirit that we would receive revelation knowledge of who you are. Wisdom and spiritual understanding. I ask, Father, that we would receive a conviction of truth. Words of hope, faith, and salvation. And, Father, that you would speak through me words that you would have spoken. Override what was said at 8 and 945. Lord, may your spirit speak by me and may your word be on my tongue. And according to Psalm 45, 1, I ask that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer that I could write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word, removing our burdens and destroying our yokes forever. As we boldly declare that, Satan is defeated. We are redeemed. And Jesus is Lord in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. If you would greet two or three people around you, wish them a Merry Christmas. Well, let's get into it. Tell your neighbor, let's get into it. I'm going to need to about 1 o'clock to do this thing right. Can you give me that? All right, then. All right, I'm going to hold you to it. Praise the Lord. Y'all clapping. You seem excited about it. We, uh, we read before the prayer in Micah chapter 5, Micah chapter 5. The reason I wanted you to see this is because in that second verse, this prophet of God declares this prophecy 
roughly 700 years before Jesus was born in saying that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And we've looked at this since last Sunday, and we'll end this study, Lord willing, today. And I love what it says here in that latter part, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. That means Jesus' origin goes before Bethlehem and before the virgin birth. I think it's easy for us to look back to Matthew and think that's the beginning of Jesus or a nativity scene and say that's the beginning of Jesus. No, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then verse 14 says, and the Word was made flesh. Declare that out loud. And the Word was made flesh. You may be familiar with the hymn we typically sing around Christmas, O come, all ye faithful, where in that hymn the words, word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. I would sing that to you right now if I could sing, but that's not my forte. That's just not my gift, all right? So I'm just going to tell you what it says. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. That's John 1.1 1, 1 and verse one, chapter 1, verse 14 combined. The word was made flesh. There are two verses I want to make sure you put in your notes. First is taken from the Old Testament. It's Psalms 40, verse 7. The second is taken from the New Testament. It's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Psalms 47, Hebrews 10 and 7. They both say the same thing. And this is what they say. That when Jesus came, he came in the volume of the book. He came in the volume of the book. It then says in the latter part of that verse that the book, the volume of the book, is written of him. In the New Testament, Hebrews 10 and 7, that word book in Greek is biblios, where we get the English word Bible. So what does the word Bible mean? It just means the volume of the books. It refers to the canon of God's word, both Old Testament and New Testament. So we have it recorded in the Old Covenant, Psalms 40 and 7. We have it in the New Covenant, Hebrews 10 and 7, both saying the same thing, that Jesus would come in the volume of the book. In other words, Jesus wasn't just born and then a record of his life began to be written and that everything we read of him started with his birth and folk looking back in time and dating what his, and writing what history records. No, what we have with Jesus is 39 books that came before he was born, before he was conceived in the virgin womb of Mary. As a matter of fact, we have over 300 hundred prophecies that would describe every detail of Jesus that was written before he was ever conceived in the virgin womb of Mary. And the new covenant and the historic words of God and history show that every word that was written before him was fulfilled by him, declaring that he is who the word says he is. And this can't be a more beautiful time to point to these things that at a time when the world is celebrating that nativity, whether they know it or not, in this season we call Christmas. If you would, turn with me to the New Testament, and I want to go to the Gospel of Luke and look at these tidings that are given to these shepherds of the birth of Jesus. The Gospel of Luke, the second chapter. So recapping that first verse we read, Micah 5, 2, God declared... 700 years before Jesus was born, where he would be born. Psalms 90 verse 2 says this, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. His word, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. The old covenant prophet Isaiah declared in chapter 7, verse 4, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which means in man, El, or in man, God, God in man. 
Isaiah 9, 6 prophesied, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. All written before he was ever born. There's nobody like Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? There is no person that's ever lived that has 39 books that has thousands of years of prophecy, all written about one man's life that when he was born and walked this earth for 30 years, every detail of his life foretold where he would be born, to whom he would be born, what kind of life he would live, how he would teach, how he would die. Psalms 22 tells us he would die on a cross. It tells us that he would have nails in his hands and in his feet. It tells us that his coat would be parted. It tells us every detail of his death, foretelling that he would lay in a rich man's tomb, foretelling that he would get up on the third day, foretelling that not only only would he be sold for 30 pieces of silver, the prophet Zacharias said the money that would be given for Jesus to be sold out would end up in the hand of the potter. And that's exactly where the money ended up to buy the potter's field. Everything foretold before it ever happened. Why? Because before we read Matthew, he was. Oh, hallelujah. In the beginning was the word. He is before the nativity that we study. He is before the shepherds that we read about. He is before Mary and her virgin womb. He is before the angel came to Joseph. He is before they laid him in that manger. He is from everlasting. Hallelujah. He's God manifested in the flesh. Nobody like him. Come on, somebody. No name like his. No record like his, no book like his. There's nobody like Jesus. There's no book like the Bible. Forty authors spanning thousands of years, men who wrote and never shared notes, but yet said the same thing. Nothing can be argued or debated. All historical fact, his word is true. He is who he says he is. Ain't nobody like Jesus. Ain't nobody like Jesus. Oh, glory to God, and we get to celebrate him today. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30 years old. For three years, he was an inerrant preacher. He never had a family or owned a home. He never set foot inside a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place in which he was born. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never did none of the things that accompany greatness. And while he was yet a young man, the tide of popular uh, opinion turned against him. His own friends deserted him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through a mockery of a trial, nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, the only piece of property that he owned, his coat was gambled for. And while he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave. Nineteen centuries have come and gone. And today he is the central figure of much of the human race. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever set, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man more on earth as powerfully as this one man, and his name is Jesus. There is no one like him. If you know him today, you ought to celebrate. If you don't know him today, I pray that you will be convinced to believe on his name. There's no love like his. There's no word like his. There's no forgiveness like his. There's no purpose like his. There's no story like his. There is nobody like Jesus. His name has power in a church. His name has power in a hospital room. His name has power in a prison cell. His name has power under a bridge. His name has power in a meth house. His name can have power in the White House. There is no power that can sustain his power because he has more power than all power. There is no name like Jesus. There's nobody like him. Who, 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 who is born and the lowest of the low, the shepherds show up, and the highest of the high, rich men from the east who were profound in their knowledge, all showing up at the same nativity? Who, what king is threatened by a baby's birth like Herod was? You're threatened when his name is Jesus because even the enemy knows who he is. 
One day I was driving down the road and it hit me that before I knew who Jesus was, my enemy knew who he was. Let that sink in later. Watch this in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number two. Come on, somebody. Woo! Man, that's good right there. There's nobody like him. There's no book like the Bible. Anybody can write a book talking about I was in the woods, saw a light, and wrote this. How do we know you really saw a light? How do we know whose light that was? How do we know everything you wrote as an individual is accurate to history? There's no book like the Bible because God don't use one author. He uses 40. He don't use men that can share notes. He spans the writing over 2,000 years. There's no book like this one. There's no word like this one. And when you dig into it like we're going to do today, you'll come to the same conclusion. Ain't no way man wrote it. Couldn't be that smart. Couldn't be that wise. Couldn't know that much. Because whoever wrote this book stands outside of time. Whoever wrote this book can see the past, the present, and the future all in the same glimpse. I can't see it like that. I do good to remember what happened yesterday and try to focus on today, much less see the future. And God is able to do all three because he is an I am God who is eternal and outside of time. But this eternal God stepped into time when he became Emmanuel Christ the Lord. Luke chapter 2, if you're there, say Amen. So here's Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem because of some taxing. The only time perhaps in history that some good stuff came out of taxing. I don't mind paying taxes. I wish we had better roads so I could see the tax money. I'm tired of another a news alert popping up. We done sent so many billions somewhere across the world. And I can't even drive down the road without needing a helmet inside my car. Flying rocks coming through my windshield. Because these roads all tore up. I don't know why I said that, but it's just the truth. I've been looking for a reason to say that. It just came out when I saw these taxes right here. Amen. Who, who's with me? Amen. I don't mind paying that, but show it to me. Ooh, man, what's going on around here? All right, back to the word. <laughs> I was about to go off. <laughs> back to the word, back to the word, back to the word, back to the word. I mean, a light, a light ought to work. Why do you got the pole and the bulb don't work? <laughs> Amen. What are we paying taxes for? All right, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. So they were being taxed, so they had to go to Bethlehem because that was the, 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 the home place of Joseph, so he had to return to the place of his nativity because of this taxing. That's what you'll see in verse 4. To be taxed, verse 5, with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. Laid him where? In a manger. Now, let's, let's, let's just understand what a manger is. A manger is a feeding trough for lambs. Bethlehem was, was a place that uh, uh, raised more lambs than probably any other city. It was known for its lambs. It was right outside of Jerusalem. At Passover, it was common for the priests to go to Bethlehem to get their lambs. That's historic. That's true. That's proven today. Bethlehem was known for its lambs. And so in many cases, the homes in Bethlehem would have the stall, what we would call a barn, neighboring the house. And, in, and you can see this historically. They would set up mangers. And when they got through eating in the living space and they wanted to feed the animals of the lambs, they'd put the food right over in the trough. They'd have windows and the animals could eat from the manger. So the manger is a, is a feeding trough. Jesus was laid in a feeding trough. And where is this feeding trough? Bethlehem. And what does Bethlehem mean? Say it, house of bread. Well, if God were going to send bread from heaven to be my salvation, it makes sense he'd be born in the house of bread bread, and not just in the house of bread, Bethlehem, but that he'd be laid in a feeding trough. God is telling me something. Stay with me, all right? And so here he is in Bethlehem, 
laid in a manger, verse 5, because there was no room in the inn. Don't think Holiday Inn. Think guest chamber of the house. So many people had come to town because of this taxing that every room was full by the time they got there and Jesus was laid in a manger. Verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone, shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Read that part out loud. Which shall be to all people. Jesus didn't come to save some people. He came to save all people. People you don't like. People you don't want to sit next to. People you may not want to invite into your home. People that you may have some odd against. Jesus came to save all people. To prove that he came to save all people. The first people to get the announcement are the shepherds. The lowly shepherds. The rejected shepherds watching their feet by night, the lowest of the low, they're told. But at the same time, the Magi and the kings out east, they're told. Why? God came to save the highest of the high, the lowest of the low, and everybody in between. There is no one outside of his reach, no matter how high you may sit or how low you may feel. Can you say amen? He came to save all people. Verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Lying where? In a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. What does that mean? That meant God had never manifested himself like this before. Glory to God. Try it one time. Say it. Glory to God. That is an accurate response to something God has done to reveal himself. When God does something to reveal himself, you say glory to God. If you have a need and you pray and that need is met, the right response is glory to God. If they said you could never have a baby and you got pregnant like was the case with my mama, you can say glory to God. God. Wasn't supposed to happen, but it still happened. Glory to God. God healed your body, and you know it was him. Glory to God. Glory to God is the response of the Lord just revealed himself in my life. And throughout the Old Testament, God revealed himself in many ways. He revealed himself as Jehovah Nisi, the way to victory. He revealed himself as Jehovah Rapha, the way to healing. He revealed himself as Jehovah Shammah, as a God that would never leave. He revealed himself as Jehovah Gamola, as a God that would reward his people. He revealed himself as Jehovah Shalom, a God that would bring peace. He revealed himself as Elohim him, a creator. He revealed himself as El Shaddai, being no one higher than him. He, he revealed himself as the many-breasted one and the all-sufficient one, El Shaddai, and El Elyon, no one being higher than him. But never had he revealed himself like this. He had put his anointing and his spirit on men of God and women of God. He had spoken through men of God and used men of God. He had given them supernatural strength like that of Samson, supernatural wisdom like that of Solomon, but never had he showed up as a man. But yet when Jesus was born in the earth, they said glory to God in the highest, in the highest, because he has never revealed himself like this before. God became a man. That's why he's called Emmanuel, which means in man L or in man God. Whoa. What you say? They say, glory to God. The angels had to say it. Glory to God. When the angels say this is the highest, they've been with him since the start. When the angels say this is the highest, you better know this is the highest. <laughs> glory to God in the highest. One line at a time. Second line, on earth peace. That didn't mean there wouldn't be any more fighting or war. It just meant man on earth can now have peace with God. Doesn't matter what your past looks like. Doesn't matter what your present looks like. Everybody can have peace with God because of what Jesus did. Can you say amen? Then he says this, goodwill toward men. Read that out loud. Goodwill toward men. 
What does that mean? That meant God sending Jesus was a goodwill act toward man. It was God's goodwill act toward man to send Jesus. A goodwill act. What does that mean? God had goodwill for man. That's why he sent Jesus. John 3, 16 might be a familiar verse to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But check out verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. He came to save us. The coming of Jesus was his good will act toward man. These are powerful statements. Verse 15, and it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto where? Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe. Where was the babe? Lying in a manger. With this in mind, come with me to the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter. John chapter six. Oh, hallelujah. What does Bethlehem mean, church? House of bread. House of bread. Bread is significant. Bread is significant. I have a very high metabolism, and when I get hungry, it can be dangerous. I need a shirt that says approach with caution. But I, I do good once I eat. But bread is, 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 is a significant thing for life. And I want to talk about bread just for a minute because I'm setting you up for what we're going to do for the next 20 minutes we got together here. When you read the Bible, Hebrews chapter 4 teaches that it's a double-edged sword. The Bible is a double-edged sword. It, it, it literally says that it will affect us physically, mentally, and spiritually. So when you read the Bible... You might be reading about something natural and tangible like bread and you think about eating and your belly being full. But with God's word, there's always a spiritual component. There's a natural component and then there's a spiritual component. And it's the spiritual component, component that the disciples kept missing and that the, the, those that heard from Jesus kept missing. That's why in, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus was teaching, and he said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. There's more to my parables than the natural story of seed being sown. There's a spiritual side to this, and it was the spiritual side that many people missed. Are y'all with me still? So when you, when you read the word, recognize there's a natural side and then there's a spiritual side and we can't miss that spiritual side. Amen. In John chapter 6, Jesus is going to work a miracle of feeding 5,000 bread. They're going to eat bread that was miraculously provided by Jesus. But within 24 hours, they are going to demand of him that he work this miracle again to prove that he is the Christ. Not because they really wanted to know that he was Christ. They just wanted to eat. I was waiting for y'all to say it. Nobody said it. Y'all like home there like, I don't, I don't want to get the wrong answer. They just wanted more bread. And so what Jesus is going to do in John 6 that we're getting ready to read is he's going to show them the missing element that they, they, they understood bread sustaining the stomach and the natural life, but they didn't understand bread and the spiritual component. So let me just give you a few examples if you've got a minute. You got a minute? Yeah. All right. So we'll begin in Genesis 3. Write this in your notes. Genesis 3, verse 19. In Genesis 3, verse 19, man has sinned against God. Man has sinned against God, Adam. And we all relate because we've all sinned against God. And a part of the judgment that man was given because of his sin was that he would eat bread by the sweat of his brow. He would eat bread by the sweat of his brow. He would need bread for physical life. But notice the spiritual component and that he has to labor for bread. Why? That was a part of the punishment for sin. All right? Still with me? We fast forward. We fast forward to a man by the name of Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. And Abraham walked out 
of this battle, this war that he should have lost, but he came out victorious. And God had already, in the pre uh, two chapters earlier, promised to bless him. And this man shows up and meets Abraham. His name is Melchizedek. And the Bible teaches he represents Jesus. You read this in Hebrews 6 and 7. He was a man that represented Jesus. He had no beginning. He had no end. He was a king and he was a priest. That's Jesus. And he shows up and he meets Abraham after Abraham had won this great battle that he shouldn't have won. And what does this Melchizedek who represents Jesus do? He gives Abraham bread and wine. Gives him bread and wine. And he says, blessed be Abram of the most high God. The Lord hath delivered thine enemies into your hand. He was letting him know, Abraham, you should not have walked out victorious. You walked out victorious because the blessing of God is on your life. And he delivers him nourishment, which was bread and wine. Same elements Jesus gave us. Fast forward 2,000 years. And Jesus in Matthew 26 gives us bread, gives the disciples bread. What does he say? He said, as often as you break this bread, as often as you eat this bread, I want you to remember me. In other words, don't just eat the bread and get your tummy full. Eat the bread and think about the spiritual component of bread. Eat this bread and think of me. There's a spiritual side. I'm going to give you another example. When the children of Israel were in Egypt and God brought them out, he brought them across a mighty sea, the Red Sea. They came across that sea. Moses went up into a mount. Moses is up in the mount. And the children, the multitude, are down at the foot of the mount. And one of the things that they complained about when Moses came down off the mount is they said, what are we going to do about bread out here in this wilderness? And this is what they said. They said, can God? Can God provide a table in the wilderness? They were worried about where they were going to get bread. So Moses takes that to God, and God drops bread down from heaven that they called manna. But this was not just to feed their bellies and sustain life. This was so that their faith could be fueled. There were other ways that God could have fed them, but he wanted the spiritual component of them knowing that he was able to provide a table in, even in the wilderness. Now, let's put it together, and I want you to read from John 6. So you had Moses up on a mountain, you had a multitude of the Israelites, and they were right by a sea. Right? That's Exodus 6. Watch this in John 6. If you're there, say amen. Notice in verse 1, you got a sea. Jesus went over the sea. Notice in verse 2, you got a multitude of people that had followed him. And notice in verse 3, Jesus went up into a mountain. That's a parallel of Exodus. The multitude having crossed the sea at the base of the mountain when Moses went up. And what were the people's number one complaint? Where are we going to get bread? So let's read verse number five. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, read it with me, Shreveport Bozier, whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Look at that. Jesus, you got all these folk here. Jesus said, where are we going to get the bread? Let's see why he asked that. Read verse 6 out loud. Ready? Read. And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Come on, somebody. Let's read it again. I'm not, I'm concerned you didn't get it. Verse 6, read again. Ready? Read. And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. This he said to make sure their bellies got full? No. This he said to prove him. That's the spiritual component. Yeah, I'm going to take care of your hunger, but I've got something bigger that I have in mind than just your hunger. That's the spiritual component. Oh, glory to God. We got to get somewhere. This is so important to God that he made it a part of our prayer that when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's the first request besides the kingdom? Give us this day our daily bread. Y'all with me? I got to make sure you, I can't, I can't go another further <laughs> until I know you're getting this right here. This, man, this, thing, this thing's going to come together. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful what Jesus is doing here because he's setting them up as, as, as a picture of what went on when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. He's setting this thing up, and that's what the dialogue is going to be throughout this chapter is they're going to boast in all, oh, you know, Moses gave us bread, and Jesus is going to say, ah, let me break it down for you. Oh, this thing's so good. 
But let me add one more, one more piece of evidence to this, so how bread has a spiritual component. Maybe two. Ruth was a Moabite. Ruth came from what was known as the wash pot. Ruth was a Gentile woman. And she travels with her mother-in-law, Naomi, after her husband died, to Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And Naomi had already kind of warned her that, you know, these folk don't receive folk from wash pots. And, you know, you're not of my nativity and I don't know what's going to go down. And so she's a stranger in the land. And she's in Bethlehem. And she goes into this person's field to glean the field that the poor were allowed to do. And Boaz, the owner of that field, Ruth caught his eye. Are you hearing him saying to you? And not only did he leave her handfuls of fruit on purpose that she could pick up, that someone else actually pulled off the tree that she got to pick up. He set a table, and he told Ruth she could come sit at his table and eat bread. Sure, you're right. Now, do you think Boaz, who has his eye on Ruth, is just concerned about her belly being full? Or do you think he's trying to send some other kind of message to Ruth? You better know he's trying to send yet some other kind of message to Ruth. Help me, men. After 10 weeks of asking my wife on a date, and she kept turning me down, I'm like, what done happened to this girl since the last time I saw her? Why won't she go out on a date with me? But she had been through something hard, and she was a little scarred, and so she was approaching me with caution. When she finally said, yes, do you think I was going to take her to McDonald's? No, I got to send a message, girl. I, 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 was, I, I didn't want just her belly to be satisfied. I wanted to fulfill the, 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 the longing of her soul. <laughs> oh, that's good right there. That's a shame she ain't here to hear this one. She was at the 945. So Boaz said, come to my table and eat bread. The bread that she ate at Boaz's table had a spiritual, bigger component than just what she was eating. I'll give you another example, last one. When, when, when David was king in Israel, and he had come up under Saul and had a friendship with Jonathan and, 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 and lived in Saul's uh, kingdom and house. When he finally became king, he remembered a promise he had made to Saul's lineage through Jonathan that, that if you ever have any children, I will always be a blessing to your children. And so he asked this man that had been faithful to the family for many years named Zabe. He said, hey, is there anybody left of Saul's house? Does Saul have any grandkids? He said, yeah, yeah, he got a boy. Live it in Lodabar. And he's lame, he's crippled. Lodabar means parched pasture. It's a place so desert-like and dry that the ground is cracking. That's what Lodabar means. And so he's in a place of poverty and his legs don't work. He was injured as a babe in a war and he can't walk. In other words, he's in a place he can't get out of. Are you in a place you don't look like you can get out of? I relate to this boy named Mephibosheth. That's his name. He's down there in Lodabar. David said, take me to him. Take me to him. And they took the king to Lodabar. And when he came to Lodabar to meet Mephibosheth, and he told Mephibosheth of the covenant that he had made with his father and grandfather, he let everybody know there was 36 people there. He said, I want you to know this boy will now sit at my table and will eat bread at my table continually as one of my sons. So the bread was more than just sustaining his stomach. The bread at the table signified, treat him like an heir. Treat him like a king. He is a son of the king. How do I know? Because he sits at the king's table and he has all the bread that he wants. It had a spiritual side to it. Physical meaning, I'm hungry. Sustain my stomach. Spiritual meaning, my soul needs something. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. That that we just covered, I hope it's going to help you understand John 6. Let's get into it. I'm coming down here with y'all. Ain't nobody going to leave. You leave them falling you out. <laughs> I left my handkerchief up there. I got to go back up there. You hear me? Get my, my exercise. Are y'all working me today? Uh, Do this again. Cameraman loving this. John 6. Look at your neighbor. Make sure they're in John 6. Are they there? So watch this. They came to Jesus and they said, uh, you know, if you really are who you say you are, why don't you show us a miracle? 
Give us, give, 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 give us a miracle. And, and then we'll know you are who you say you are. And Jesus is like, yeah, man, I already worked that miracle for you. See, back up to verse 30, or go down to verse 30, John 6, if you're there, say amen. They said, therefore, unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Church, let's make sure we're clear. The day before, the day before, he fed 5,000 with two fish and five barley loaves. He's already shown them what he can do. They're not asking him to work a miracle to prove that he's Christ because they really want to see who he is. They want the miracle because they're hungry. But it's been less than 24 hours since they ate of his bread. Let me show you what Jesus says to them. Because this is not what it's about. It looks like what it's what it's about, but this is not what it's about. Go back to verse 26. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me. You seek me. You seek me, not because you saw the miracles. Come on, church. You seek me not because you saw the miracles. Read the rest. But because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Boy, us folk ain't changed. You feed me good, I'm coming back. They just wanted to eat again. You see, you're not, you didn't come all the way back around here. See, let me kind of set it up for you. The sea that Jesus had passed over was kind of a horseshoe shape. And on the narrow side of it, Jesus went by boat to the other side. When they came to follow Jesus, if you read back and read on, you'll see there were no more boats to take. There were no, no, no more taxis to take to cross the sea. They had to walk all the way around that big horse. They had traveled a long way. It was work to go that far. And Jesus said, you done came all the way around this sea to find me. Not because of the miracles I worked. You just want to eat again. So watch what he says in verse 27. Labor not. Labor not for the meat which perisheth. You're just working for stuff that perish. You done burnt that food off. But I'd rather you labor for the meat which endureth unto what? Everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath the Father sealed. So let's make sure we're understanding this. They're looking at bread from the physiological. I'm hungry again. Jesus is looking at the bread. I'm trying to build your faith up in God. So watch what happens. Verse number uh, uh, 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God then? What what, 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 what what we do? What we do? What kind of work we got to do? When my daddy came home from work, if my mama didn't have some hot water cornbread, come on, somebody. <laughs> hey, that's eating. If he ain't had none, figure it out. It'll take you a little while. You got to know how to do it. You got to be gifted. Make hot water cornbread right. If my mama didn't have hot water cornbread or had not baked any cornbread, she'd put a loaf of light bread right by my daddy's plate on the table. And she, he'd pull from, my daddy always ate bread with his meal. And he'd pull that light bread out. He did that when he got off work. We don't look at eating bread as work. We, le we look at eating bread as the reward after I've worked. Jesus said, I got bread you're not laboring for. Uh, the bread's not the work. The bread's the reward after the work. Jesus said, you've been eating bread you work for. I want you to eat the bread I'm working for. That's what he's about to say. Watch this. 
So, so he said, why are you laboring for this food that just perishes? I got food that will take you all the way into eternity. Verse 28, they said back, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God. Read that out loud. This is the work of God. Keep reading. That you believe on him in whom he has sent. Read it again, Shreveport Bossier. This is the work of God. That you believe on him whom he has sent. Only work I want you to do is believe. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And says we're not saved by works lest we could brag about it and we could boast about it that's not what saved us I'm saved by his life not my life yeah. Woo. then that's when they said back what sign show us thou verse 31 our fathers our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said back to them, verse 32, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses didn't give you that bread from heaven. My Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. You hadn't had true bread yet. Oh, my goodness. You, you, you ain't had the bread from heaven yet. They're saying, oh, our fathers ate bread from heaven. Jesus said, no, he didn't. That was a prototype. That was something God did to point to me. The bread, you didn't eat the bread. The bread wasn't here yet. The bread was born in the house of bread, Bethlehem. The bread was laid in a manger, a feeding trough where you put bread. You ain't had, nobody had no bread yet. I am the bread. How could you have eaten what hadn't been sent yet? All of those miracles, all of those provisions in the Old Testament that had, done, had been done by God pointed to Jesus. Just keep reading, you'll see it. My daddy, my daddy ate the bread from heaven. My daddy, my daddy ate the bread from heaven. Jesus was like, no, he didn't. It wasn't sent yet. Stay with me. See, when we sing a whole little town called Bethlehem, how still we see Eli. We need to know what we're singing. We're going to sit up a nativity in your yard and don't know what it means. We better know what this stuff means. God, our kids more worried about receiving gifts, and we don't know the gift. We can't let this world cover up the true meaning of what we ought to be celebrating. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hey. Uh, let me, let me, hey, let me get this out. Verse 33, he said, for the bread of God is he. See, you got to read with me. Look at verse 33. For the bread of God is he. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. That's the bread. That's why I was born in the house of bread and laid in a manger, a food trough for bread. Then said they, verse 34, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Jesus said, you still ain't getting it. Look at verse 35. I am the bread of life. What you mean give you? I am the bread. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I am the bread. Verse 38, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which he has sent me, that of all which hath he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Oh, but you got to watch what they're getting ready to say and how Jesus is going to respond. Put your seatbelt on. I'll be done in just a minute. Then, you got to see this. This is so good. This is my third time preaching. This kid's getting gooder. I'm being real, man. This thing getting better every time I do it. This thing, man, his word is good. See, watch verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him. 
Because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. So they're mocking this. Look at what they said in verse 42. This is so important. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? I got to put my bookmark. This is so good. They said, wait, wait, no, no, wait, 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 wait. We, we know Jesus. He grew up in a little bitty town. He was born in the smallest little town, Bethlehem. Was there two years before they went off down to Egypt because there was a threat to kill his life. He grew up in Nazareth when they came back. They had more than 12 families living in that little neighborhood. We've been knowing him his whole life. We know his mama, Mary. We know his daddy, Joseph. How could he say, I never did. You see him come down? I didn't see him come down. When anybody see him come down? I didn't see him come down. These people are supposed to know the word. They're supposed to know the word. And they, they, they say, how, 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 when did he come down when we know where he came from? We know he came from Mary. How could he come down from heaven? They don't know the book. Because from the time that man sinned, in Genesis chapter 3, God pulled Mary, I'm sorry, Eve, Adam, and the serpent aside together. And he said, because of what you've done, Satan, and because of who you use, woman, I am going to use this woman just like you just used her. And I'm going to bring from this woman a man child. A man child is going to come out of this woman, and that man child is going to crush your head, Satan. So from the very beginning, God didn't say he was going to send a Savior from the sky. He said, I'll send a Savior from the womb. What we celebrate at Christmas is so meaningful because it shows us how God was going to bring salvation. And they're like, well, we know Mary, we know Joseph, but you don't know everything. Because if you knew everything, you knew Joseph never even touched Mary. She was a virgin when that boy was born. Joseph got in the equation so they wouldn't have stoned Mary. There was no need for Joseph at that time unless, unless Mary have a covering because in that day, if a woman shows up pregnant, then they would have stoned her. For, then she would have been judged for having committed adultery. Yeah, we know Mary. We know Joseph. He didn't come out of no heaven. We know where he came from. You don't know the book. If you knew what Isaiah said in chapter 7, he said, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child, and you will call his name Emmanuel, God in man. You missed Isaiah 9, where he said, unto us a child is given, uh, uh, sorry, a, a child is born, a son is given, the government shall rest upon his shoulder, he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, and of his kingdom shall be no end. You miss Micah chapter 5 verse 2 when the Bible says the ruler of Israel would be born in Bethlehem. So you're talking about you ain't seen the sky open. You didn't realize that was not the pathway in which God brought salvation. He brought salvation through a nativity. He brought salvation through the virgin womb of Mary. And everything about that nativity pointed to why he came. Jesus responded, I'm almost done. I told you, give me the one o'clock, I got two minutes. <laughs> Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. Verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Read verse 48 out loud. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. You bragging about what your daddy is. Your daddy is dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Oh, look at verse 51. I'm almost done. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Well, if you're the living bread, where do you think God would send you? Oh, Bethlehem, the house of bread. Where do you think you'd be laid as a baby? Oh, a manger, a, a feeding trough for lambs. Everything about it points to who he is. 
If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And that's why Jesus came to be bread to be life, that once you receive it, once you receive it, once you receive it, you go from death to life. He not only quenches and satisfies the hunger of my physical life, he meets the greater need of my soul. For what would it profit if a man gained the whole world, but he lost his own soul? There is something that Jesus brings that goes beyond anything your mind could ever wrap itself around. It's the wholeness, it's the contentment, it's the peace that he brings to life. When I'm hungry, he feeds me. When I feel empty, he fills me. That's Jesus. Hallelujah. And we need to be able to look at the manger and say, he's the bread. Look at the word Bethlehem and say, he's the bread. He's my life. He's my life. He's my life. He's my life. He's not an experience I had eight years ago. Give me this day my daily bread. Jesus said, as often you as you eat bread, as often as you eat bread, think about me. I thought about this earlier. I'm closing. I've seen enough. I've seen enough in his word to believe. I've seen enough. I don't know everything there is to know, but I've seen enough in his word to believe with every head bowed on both our campuses. Can we pray? Every head bowed. Just for a moment. Have you seen enough to believe? Have you seen enough to believe? I don't know everything there is to know. I've been a student of the Word since the age of 17. All my adult life, I don't know. There's so much I don't know. I never graduated Bible college or seminary. But I've seen enough to believe. I've seen enough. What he wants from you today is your belief. Do you believe? Do you believe, do you believe that God sent his son through a virgin named Mary? Do you believe he was born in a little city called Bethlehem because he would be the bread sent from heaven to save our lives? We'll always have questions. There'll always be things that go beyond our understanding and comprehension. But have you seen enough to believe? Have you seen enough in his word to believe? We doubt, we fear, we struggle, we're tempted, we fail. We fall, we miss it, we get offended. But have you seen enough to believe? You don't have to join a religion. Jesus didn't come to establish a religion. Jesus came to restore a relationship. Have you seen enough to believe? Two thousand years have come and gone. His word still being preached. His name is still celebrated. People still testify of how it's changed their life. Have you seen enough to believe? You might not know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, but have you heard enough? Have you seen enough to believe? I'm so grateful that God has made His Word relatable. And I'm so grateful he made salvation so simple. Because then he made it complicated. I don't know that I could be saved. Jesus 
said, do you understand bread? Do you understand hunger? Do you understand what you'd go through just to eat again? Do you know that struggle? Spiritually, I want to end that struggle. You don't have to sweat to be saved. You don't have to work to be saved. I want to end that struggle for you. They said, show us the work to do. Show us the work. Show us the work so that we can have this life. Jesus said, this is the work. Believe on him whom God has sent. If you're watching live right now or on our telecast, can you believe? Can you believe? If you never join this church, if you never walk in a church, can you believe? Just can you believe? If you're visiting here for the first time, maybe you're from out of town, can you believe? Can you take with you? I believe in this man named Jesus. I believe, I believe that he came. right out of high school and the church I visited gave an invitation I had my hand in my pocket and there was a quarter of dime nickels and I was just moving them around trying to keep my mind distracted because I didn't want to pray and didn't want no church stuff I was just there to get my aunt to leave me alone and I knew I knew I needed to call on the Lord I ended up kneeling at the altar. Nobody told me what to pray. I didn't know what to pray. I had not really prayed unless I wanted something before. And I couldn't even tell you what I prayed. But I know I came to Jesus that morning. And I know he changed my life. He didn't make me perfect. But his love for me was perfect. He didn't give me unfailing faith. But he's never failed me. And there's no way I could ever go back to the version of him that didn't know him. Because once you meet him, you will never deny him. And I cannot deny him. We can't deny it. Just believe. Don't try to figure it all out. Just believe. Man made it complicated. Church made it complicated. Religion made it complicated. Jesus made it simple. Do you believe? So I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I've seen enough in your word to believe. You said, Jesus. No. 
said yet on the cross you died for mine you live today because you were raised from the dead and I believe you're coming again and that today through faith in you you give life so give me life and use my life for your purpose for your glory use me to help others know who you are seen enough to believe in Jesus name amen 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 can we give Jesus a hand clap offering for his word oh hallelujah man glory to God Merry Christmas let's stand together if you need prayer on either one of our campuses we have men and women of faith down front they're here to pray with you. Just come forward. Let them pray with you. That's what they're there for. Otherwise, Merry Christmas. Have a blessed Christmas. And hope to see you back here on Wednesday night. I'll be here on my birthday. I'm going to preach on my birthday. I'm excited about that. All right. Two days after Jesus. Amen. All right. I love you guys. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Teach the nativity to your family. All right. I love you guys.